Here in Kiev in recent days, the Maidan, Independence Square, has turned into a full-scale war zone. More clashes in Ukraine's capital, Kiev. There is absolutely no doubt that snipers are working here. I've counted 10 bodies. We don't know who shot in the people. It's a problem. Now on the brink of a civil war, at least 70 dead so far, and the death toll rising. Эти технологии, еще раз говорю, от них не застраховано ни одно государство. What we saw here today was a revolution. А хотите узнать, что происходило на Украине? We've invested over five billion dollars to assist Ukraine in these and other goals. Вы знаете, в большой политике о чем бы ни говорили, все равно будут говорить о деньгах. NATO has expanded into 13 countries, up to the borders of Russia. 13 countries. The focus has to be on not allowing this crisis to turn into hot war between Ukraine and Russia. Эта тема очень опасная. Это тема войны. Сегодня спокойно никто не должен себя чувствовать. It's an ancient and proud land with a rich history filled with much beauty, heroism, and sacrifice. Ukraine is a borderland, a place where East meets West. This is the flag of Ukraine. The blue represents the sky, the gold its seemingly endless fields of wheat. Ukraine is a prize many have sought, and much blood is spilled in the quest to possess it. Ukraine has been the pathway for Western powers as they attempted to conquer the East in World War I and World War II. And every time, the Ukrainian people ended up paying the highest price for these grand games of power. History doesn't repeat, but it surely rhymes, said Mark Twain. If one looks closely at the history of Ukraine, one will notice many rhymes. Being surrounded by stronger powers, Ukraine has needed a lot of cunning to survive, and the art they truly mastered with time is the art of changing sides. In the middle of the 17th century, Ukrainian leader Bogdan Hmelnitsky broke a truce agreement made with Poland, siding with more powerful Russia. Just over 50 years later, as the Russian-Swedish war was raging, another Ukrainian leader, Ivan Mazepa, broke the union with Russia when he switched sides, joining forces with the Swedish invaders. Many times, Ukrainian history was written by third parties. Seeking to keep the gains of a revolution at any cost, Russia agreed to the humiliating conditions of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty of 1918, which turned Ukraine into a German protectorate. Another historical document that changed the fate of Ukraine was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939. 
One of many such agreements being signed between European countries and rising Germany. Attempting to protect his nation from the approaching Nazi threat, Joseph Stalin negotiated a treaty of non-aggression with Adolf Hitler. While promising each other peace, the Soviet and German foreign ministers Molotov and Ribbentrop realigned the map of Eastern Europe, splitting it into German and Soviet spheres of influence. No sooner had the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact been signed than Poland was split. And in September of 1939, Eastern Poland awoke to be Western Ukraine and a part of the family of Soviet republics and the USSR. But even this bold dividing of lands and nations only delayed the inevitable. Germany broke its promise to the USSR. On June 22, 1941, Germany invaded the USSR, launching Barbarossa, the largest military operation in world history. Barbarossa was aiming for St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Kiev, Ukraine, three destinations of major significance. Ukraine, with its rich lands and resources, was an important industrial and economic source for the USSR. To cut it off from the Soviet Union would strike a big blow indeed. For most of the Soviet Union, the Second World War was about fighting the invaders of their land. But it wasn't quite so simple for Ukraine. The truth is, Ukraine has never been a united country. When World War II broke out, a large part of Western Ukraine's population welcomed the German soldiers as liberators from the recently forced upon them Soviet rule and openly collaborated with the Germans. The real scale of collaboration was not announced for many years after the war, but we now know that whole divisions and battalions were formed by Ukrainian collaborators, such as SS Galician, Noctigal, and Roland battalions. Just in the beginning of the war, more than 80,000 people from Galicina region voluntarily enrolled into Division SS Galician in a month and a half, notorious for their extreme cruelty towards the Polish, Jewish, and Russian people on the territory of Ukraine. Members of these military groups came mostly from the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN, founded in 1929 this organization had an ultimate goal of creating an ethnically pure, independent Ukraine and considered terror an acceptable tool for achieving their ends. Their official flag was black and red, land and blood. It will remain in Ukraine's history long after the OUN will cease to exist. In early 1940, the most radical nationalistic part of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists got its own leader, Stepan Bandera. Severely anti-Semitic and anti-communist, he proclaimed an independent Ukraine in 1941. His German allies frowned upon such an act of self-will, and it landed him in prison for nearly all the Second World War. Not participating in the events physically, Bandera still managed to successfully spread his ideology. Many independent historians estimate that the OUN militia exterminated from 150 to 200,000 Jews on Ukrainian territory occupied by the Germans by the end of 1941. The most notorious and outrageous massacre took place September 29th and 30th, 1941 in Babiar, Kiev. All kikes of the city of Kiev and its vicinity must appear on Monday, September 29th by 8 o'clock in the morning. Bring documents, money and valuables, and also warm clothing, linen, etc. Any kikes who do not follow this order and are found elsewhere will be shot. 33,771 Jews were killed in this two-day operation of the Nazis and Ukrainian militia. Another outrageous massacre was carried out by the Ukrainian insurgent army and the Bandera faction of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists 
in German-occupied Polish Volhynia and eastern Galicia between 1943 and 1944. This genocide of Poles was led by Mikola Lebed, 35,000 to 60,000 people in Volhynia and 25 to 40,000 in eastern Galicia fell victim to this massive ethnic cleansing operation. Sensing the inevitable loss of the German troops, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists gave up on their former ally and began fighting equally against the Germans and the Soviet forces. In January 1943, USSR troops started pushing the Nazis back, liberating one part of Ukraine after another. Western Ukraine was the last Ukrainian region held by the Germans, finally being liberated in October of 1944. Bandera's bands continued to wage their guerrilla war against the Soviet regime, carrying out bloody raids on Ukrainian villages and towns, and leaving behind chaos and casualties. This war went on until the middle of the 1950s, when the last collaborators were either detained or fled the country. On May 7, 1945, Germany unconditionally surrendered to the Allies. Ukraine remained a part of the Soviet Union. The peace after the Second World War was short-lived. The United States and the Soviet Union, nations who allied together along with England to defeat the Nazis, tragically became foes as the Cold War began. The era of political and military tension between the U.S. and the USSR lasted for nearly 45 years, keeping humanity under the constant threat of nuclear war. In this battle, the United States never lost sight of Ukraine's importance. U.S. intelligence kept a close eye on Ukrainian nationalists' organizations as a possible source of counterintelligence against the Soviet Union. CIA documents that just recently have been declassified show strong ties between U.S. intelligence and Ukrainian nationalists since 1946. From the CIA agency report, it is clear that they were not mistaken about the nature of Ukrainian nationalist organizations or their leader, Stepan Bandera himself. According to an OSS report of September 1945, Bandera had earned a fierce reputation for conducting a reign of terror during World War II. After the Second World War, Bandera and other Ukrainian Nazi leaders fled to Europe where the CIA helped them hide. The CIA later informed the Immigration and Naturalization Service that it had concealed Stefan Bondera and other Ukrainians from the Soviets. The operations involving Ukrainians continued for many years. The Nuremberg trials of 1945 and 1946 brought the political, economic, and military leaders of fascist Germany to justice and revealed to the world the monstrous face of Nazism and the crimes they committed. But the Ukrainian Nazis were spared the same fate, and some were even granted indulgences by the CIA. By 1954, the agency excused the illegal activities of the OUN security branch in the name of Cold War necessity. In 1949, Mykola Lebed, the man responsible for the massacres in Volhynia, was moved to the United States, where he died in 1989 without ever being investigated or pursued as a war criminal. The CIA moved to protect Ukrainian nationalist leader Mykola Lebed from criminal investigation by the Immigration and Naturalization Service in 1952. Perhaps Bandera lost his use to the U.S., or maybe KGB agents outsmarted the CIA, but in 1959, Stepan Bandera, the leader of the Ukrainian nationalists, was killed in Munich, where he was hiding under the name of Stefan Popol. It would be fair to say that Bandera became a major symbol of Ukrainian nationalism by sheer chance, for he was neither its only leader nor its most powerful one. Dmitro Dontsov was the father of the far-right totalitarian doctrine in Ukraine. Andriy Melnik was the leader of another faction of the OUN, 
Roman Shuhevich was a general of the Ukrainian insurgent army, and others contributed greatly to the movement. Bandera's dangerous ideology, suppressed by the communist authorities, but supported by external forces, never really died. The seeds of Ukrainian nationalism were passed from generation to generation. Unfortunately, it was just a matter of time before they would once again blossom. In 1954, Ukraine's territory was expanded even more when Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the USSR, and a Ukrainian himself, generously gave the Crimean region to Ukraine. Historians would argue about the legitimacy of this transfer for many years to come, and 60 years after Khrushchev's gift, dramatic new events would take place in Crimea. The eyes of the world are on Ukraine as the crisis in Crimea continues. Dozens of heavily armed men seized government buildings in Crimea. Should Ukraine just shrug its shoulders and say, OK, Crimea, it's lost? And the old arguments would heat up once again. The Cold War would heat up and cool down by turns, while both rivals were obsessively building up military capacity. The turning point took place when the new era, Perestroika, came to the USSR with its new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, in the middle of the 1980s. Perestroika meant restructuring towards liberalization and democratization. It certainly had a positive impact on the international situation. Well, astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. But inside the USSR, the weakening of Kremlin control had different consequences. In Ukraine, a nationalistic political organization, Narodny Ruk, or People's Movement, emerged in 1989 due to this new openness. They advocated for independence of Ukraine from the USSR and became an incubator for leaders of Ukrainian neo-Nazism. In 1991, one of them, Oleg Tyagnibok, founded Svoboda, an openly radical nationalist party preaching the good old principles of Bandera. Purge Ukraine from the Jews and Russians, Ukraine for Ukrainians, and so on. His statements got him fifth place in the Simon Wiesenthal Center Top 10 Anti-Semitic World Leader Rankings of 2012. But also, sadly, attracted numerous followers. Dmitry Yarosh founded another extreme right organization, Trizu, or Trident, in 1994. In April 2013, Yarosh became an assistant to a member of parliament from the opposition party Utah. Later that same year, he would become the leader of the most radical Ukrainian Nazi group, the Right Sector. Andriy Paruby would soon appear leading a whole army of ultra-nationalist warriors. And the torch marches would once again light up the streets of Ukrainian cities. The world drastically changed in August 1991 when the USSR de facto ceased to exist, a global political map welcomed many newcomers, Ukraine one of them. In modern history, it was the first time Ukraine was truly independent and all on its own. The red flag came down over the Kremlin tonight as President Gorbachev resigned and brought to an end seven decades of communist rule in the Soviet Union. The years after the disintegration of the USSR became known as the crazy 90s in all the post-Soviet territories. He's leaving behind 15 independent states which share only a disastrous economy and an uncertain future. After having been under a government-controlled economy, the free market dramatically changed the rules of the game. 
new businesses emerged instantly, and the first oligarchs were born overnight. The former country with no class division suddenly became stratified. The chosen few became rich, while the rest had to fight to survive. Сразу же после получения независимости началась еще более дикая приватизация и растаскивание имущества государственной собственности, понижение жизненного уровня населения сразу же после получения независимости. И причем какие бы власти не меняли друг друга, для жизни рядового гражданина ничего не изменяло. Не менял. Там происходил просто систематический грабеж населения, грабеж граждан, грабеж украинского народа. И, конечно, люди уже устали от этого произвола, от этой совершенно сумасшедшей коррупции. The people's growing discontent made Ukraine more vulnerable to outside forces, and a new kind of warfare was launched, one not known before, the color revolutions. Demonstrators clash with police, hundreds of thousands protesting, the results of the election and calling for a new vote. Ukraine has had two color revolutions in its 24 years of independence. In 2004, crowds of people descended upon Kiev, marking the start of the Orange Revolution. At that time, Ukraine became once again a battlefield of two forces, the Russian and Western governments. The culmination of this conflict took place during the presidential elections in November of 2004. The two major candidates, Western-backed Viktor Yushchenko and Russian-leaning Viktor Yanukovych, almost equally shared the votes of Ukrainians. By the way, calling Viktor Yushchenko Western-backed is not an exaggeration. His wife, Katerina Yushchenko, is a former U.S. State Department official and worked in the White House during the Reagan administration. The division was along geographic lines. Traditionally, Russian Eastern Ukraine voted for Yanukovych, while Western Ukraine chose Yushchenko. By the announced result, Viktor Yushchenko lost to Viktor Yanukovych, but thousands of people didn't agree with it, and they came to the central square of Kiev on the 22nd of November. The situation received wide news coverage. The country's election commission ignored reports of fraud, declaring Kremlin-backed Viktor Yanukovych the winner. International politicians, such as former General Secretary of NATO, Javier Solana, became frequent guests in Kiev, initiating negotiations between parties. And I hope very much that the goodwill of everybody will be able to overcome this difficulty. The results of the negotiations, however, were often reached only on paper. Thus, Yushchenko never told the supporters to stop blocking government buildings in central Kiev. Therefore, these non-violent and very orange protests lasted for a month, during which time the previous election results were annulled, marred by massive corruption, and new elections were announced. An important nuance, just three months before, Viktor Yushchenko became a victim to a mysterious and still unsolved poisoning. But it didn't prevent him from winning in the new election. Though as we shall soon see, there was much more than just the people's will that led to this victory. This peaceful revolution and its leader were warmly welcomed by the international community. But the euphoria didn't last long. Yushchenko's government completely failed with reforms and lost its chance to establish democracy, instead descending into infighting. Viktor Yushchenko was not re-elected for a second term, but at the end of his presidency, he had the time to make one last gift to his supporters from Western Ukraine. На завершення я хочу сказати про те, що чекали мільйони українських патріотів і багато років. Я підписав указ за незламність духу відстоювані національні ідеї, виявлені героїзм і самопожертву в боротьбі за незалежну українську державу. Постановляю присвоїти звання Герою України з удостоєнням Ордена Держави Бандері Степану Андрійовичу. Слава Україні! The hero status of Stepan Bandera was short-lived. In 2010, Viktor Yanukovych was elected president. This time, the international community had no doubts about the legitimacy of the elections.
In January 2011, Viktor Yanukovych repealed the hero title of Bandera. Almost four years into his presidency, though, another revolution shook Ukraine. Unfortunately, this one was anything but peaceful. Mr. Yanukovych, I'm an American, I'm an outsider to this situation, and it's very complicated. But I would like, as a, as a filmmaker, just to jump into the action and go to those moments in November 2013. You're president of the Ukraine. You've been president for three years at this point. The country is in bad economic shape, very bad. You have a trade agreement with Russia, and now you're seeking to make a better agreement with the EU, with the European Union, and you are negotiating. Can you bring me to that moment and what you're thinking? Действительно, это был очень сложный период времени для Украины, и нам нужно было найти решение проблем в 2013 году. Поэтому у нас было два партнера. Прежде всего, мы рассчитывали на Международный валютный фонд. Но Международный валютный фонд на протяжении года, когда мы вели переговоры, нам предлагал неприемлемые для нас варианты решения. Значительное поднятие тарифов для населения, прежде всего на энергоносители и на газ, то есть рост, значительный рост расходов населения, при том, что доходы оставались прежние. Мы на это не пошли. Мы предложили другие варианты решения вопросов, Мы получили официальный отказ Международного валютного фонда в ноябре 2013 года. Оставалась Россия. Россия нам сказала, что мы готовы с вами работать как партнеры, если вы учтете наши интересы. Того, что экономика Украины и России зарождалась как единая экономика, сложились абсолютно уникальные, особые экономические отношения. Рынки в России были полностью открыты для украинских товаров, а при этом наши границы с Украиной таможены полностью раскрыты. Таким образом, Евросоюз как бы заходил со всеми своими товарами на нашу территорию без всяких переговоров. И когда мы начали считать балансы, мы увидели, что Соглашение, которое подготовлено Европой для Украины, требует больших экономических расходов, компенсаций потерь. А Европа компенсации не предлагает. При том, что российский рынок при этом для Украины частично сокращался или прокрывался. Вы сказали, конечно, если Украина решила так поступить, это ее выбор, и мы уважаем этот выбор. Но мы не должны этот выбор оплачивать. Да. Наши переговоры с Европой не увенчались успехом. Поэтому на этом пути мы предложили сделать паузу. Violent clashes erupted in the Ukrainian capital Kiev as more than 100,000 people protested against a government decision to delay an association deal with the EU. Vitaly, you were Minister of Interior Affairs for the Ukraine during this period, and you were Chief of Police, essentially, of the country. Can you tell me your version of what happened from November protests through February protests? We had the information that protest actions in any case планируются и начнутся в 2015 году. Но оппозиция воспользовалась тем фактом, что в начале кабинет министров, а затем и президент приняли решение временно отложить подписание ассоциации с Европейским Союзом. Арсений Яценюк, лидер of the opposition party, Fatherland. Олег Тагнибок, лидер of the opposition nationalist far right political party, Svoboda. Vitaly Klitschko, leader of the opposition party, Udar. As both EU and Ukrainian officials said on Thursday, the suspension of talks on closer ties could be revived after the two-day meeting. But officials said the deal was off the table for now. 
pro-EU protests on the streets of Kiev enter their second day. The crowd of around a thousand protesters were joined by the leader of the opposition, the reigning world boxing champion Vitaly Klitschko. He called on the demonstrators to maintain pressure on the government after it decided not to sign a major trade deal with the EU. You go back to Kiev the next day after the meeting with Merkel and the protests are up, am I right? Can you take me through that period? Понимание того, что это мирные акции, и во время мирных акций можно вести диалог, и я к этому был готов. И говоря о протестах ноября-февраля, необходимо обязательно учитывать динамику их развития, которая происходила на Украине заранее до того. Огромное количество общественных организаций, которые финансировались из-за рубежа, огромное количество журналистов, работающих на гранты. Robert Perry is a longtime investigative journalist based in Washington, D.C., best known for his major disclosures about the Iran-Contra scandal in the 1980s. He is the founder of Consortium News, where he has reported extensively on the crisis in Ukraine and the forces behind the unrest. An NGO is a non-governmental organization. Now, many NGOs are quite legitimate. They represent uh, good causes. Maybe they help people in a country feed or deal with water problems or deal with various kinds of social problems. But there are some NGOs that have become funded by government entities uh, and serve more the purpose of that government rather than trying to serve the people that they are ostensibly working for. One thing we saw in the 1980s, at that point the Central Intelligence Agency had been largely discredited because of scandals that had been exposed in the 1970s. For 15 years, the CIA has secretly financed overseas activities of the National Students Association. But then there came to light a fantastic web of CIA penetrations. So when the Reagan administration came in, there was this concept that instead of having the CIA, which traditionally would go into these different target countries, funding their media, funding NGOs, funding uh, different political operations, that was essentially farmed out to a, a new organization called the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created in 1983. And it would do pretty much what the agency used to do. It would go into one of these countries and it would support various political groups, train activists, uh, deal with journalists, uh, business groups, and try to advance U.S. foreign policy interests, sometimes against the interests of the, of the host government, the target government. And beyond that, they received financial and other logistical help from the National Endowment for Democracy and other U.S. agencies. That helped them training activists, working with journalists to get, uh, get their side presented more favorably. They work on things like, how do you get traction? How do you get things to go viral? How do you then use that to generate support for your cause? And support was generated. Mustafa Nayyem. Mustafa Nayyem a founder of one of Ukraine's new media outlets, Dromatske TV, knew very well how to make something go viral. It was his notorious Facebook post on November 21, 2013, that brought the first crowds to Maidan. I wrote this just to hear, are these people? Or we talk about this on Facebook? If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you are misinformed. To deliver your message efficiently enough in the modern world with so many different technologies and means of communications, you must embrace them all. As the disturbing events of Euromaidan started on November 21, 2013, three new TV channels went on the air and suddenly became stunningly popular in Ukraine. Spill No TV, November 21st. Romatske TV, November 22nd, and Espresso TV, November 24th, directly from opposition protest. These channels went viral, supporting the protests and encouraging more and more people to come to Maidan. И первые выступления массовые начались с 21 числа, 21 ноября. Сначала акции проходили мирно, на эти акции пришли люди, 
разных, разной категории. Это были молодые и пожилые люди, приходили с детьми. Явно было понятно, что э, с их стороны есть доверие к власти, к, в том числе и к правоохранителям, потому что свободно выходили. И никаких э, намеков э, на то, что будет в отношении э, этих манифестантов приниматься какие-то меры воздействия, силовые и так далее, просто не существовало. Значит, соответственно, на охрану общественного порядка выходили правоохранители без э, огнестрельного оружия. Но среди петингующих уже замечены нами радикалы, которые относились к правым партиям, неофашистским организациям. И 24 числа, 24 ноября, они осуществили первую агрессивную акцию. Двадцать четвертого числа первое было нападение на кабинет министров и первое нападение на сотрудников правоохранителей, которые охраняли. Второе нападение на правоохранителей э, службы безопасности Украины произошло 25 числа. Затем небезызвестные события 30 числа. November 30th of 2013 became the first turning point of Euromaidan and one of its most reported and mysterious events. Я тогда немножко вот расскажу, как видел эти события я. Был звонок мне от Попова, глава администрации да, города Киева. Он говорил, что давайте вот сегодня там мы хотели бы завозить оборудование для новогодней елки на площадь. Я ему объяснил, что до тех пор, пока люди находятся на площади, то этого делать нельзя. В районе часа ночи, когда вот Массовые люди начали расходиться, разъезжаться. Значит, я поговорил по телефону с руководителем службы безопасности Украины и спросил его точку зрения по развитию событий. Он сказал, ну, я считаю, что, слава богу, все закончилось. Вот вся информация идет о том, что все закончилось. Потому что фактически с 21 числа ну, я вот в кабинете просто жил и спал там какое-то время, может быть, там два часа в сутки удавалось поспать. Около трех часов ночи я приехал тоже к себе домой. Завел часы на 6.30 утра, включил телевизор сразу же, когда проснулся. Он у меня был настроен на пятый канал. И пятый канал демонстрирует большое количество скорой помощи. И там побитые люди. Меня, честно говоря, пробил просто холодный пот. Моя первая реакция на то, что Майдан пострадал от действий полиции, была мгновенной. Нужно было расследовать, кто дал приказ разгонять митингующих, применять к ним силу. Я был противник того, чтобы к митингующим применялась сила, нарушали права людей. Решений таких Попов самостоятельно принимать просто не мог. А кто для него был самый высокий руководитель? Для Попова был самый большой руководитель, это глава администрации. Сергей Владимирович Левочкин. Coincidentally, Sergei Lovochkin is a close associate to many U.S. politicians. The security service of Ukraine had evidence that on that night, Lovochkin was in contact with opposition leader Yatsenyuk, where they discussed the clearing of Maidan on the pretext of installing the annual Christmas tree. News media reported that the riot police cruelly attacked the students peacefully sleeping in their tents. But scenes from the event seem to tell a different story. It appears that the protesters were waiting for the police. Additionally, there were dozens of journalists and cameramen from all the new public TV news outlets prepared to cover the events. And most ominously, a group of well-trained young men arrived to Maidan almost simultaneously with the riot police. They infiltrated the crowd and began provocations with insults, stones, and torches. The right sector in Ukraine represents a part of the Ukrainian population that has often favored fairly extreme right-wing positions. They had militias that uh, came especially during the Maiden protests. There were groups that were being shipped into Kiev 
where they would provide the muscle, in effect, for the demonstrations. So the demonstrations went from being relatively peaceful political protests to being increasingly violent. The first step in any detective work is to establish a motive. It is now said that Sergei Lovochkin is held in high esteem by his powerful U.S. friends. Outraged by what was reported in the news, the Ukrainian people came out in force on the next day to vent their anger with the police actions. The violence started to take off when? Фактически жесткие противоправные действия начались уже в декабре 2013 года. События, которые проходили в тот период в Киеве, они были очень радикальные. В них принимали неонацистские организации, молодые люди, которые были различными вооружены различными средствами, металлические прутья, биты. В том числе использовалась техника, например, дорожно-строительная, грейдерами, и они грейдерами наезжали на э, работников правоохранительных органов, на милицию, которая защищала и не давала захватить правительственные здания и здания администрации президента. Как президент мог такой неуправляемой толпе выйти и с кем говорить? Технологии, которые применялись в тот период времени, они были заранее спланированы. As veiled and masked as the color revolutions can be, an attentive viewer can see subtle patterns and similarities revealing their true nature. To make crowds act as one obedient group, they have to be united at the unconscious level. The masterminds of color revolutions know this well and have perfected the art. Symbolism is one of the most powerful tools to achieve this end. Revolutionary political organizations with surprisingly similar names and even more similar logos have appeared time and again almost as omens marking the countries that would be hit by the colored plague next. They are often described as being aware and active when they're actually trained and radical. They are the ones who take the first shot, literal and metaphorical, to transform the peaceful protests into full-blown coup d'etats. Their fingerprints can be found everywhere on the map of the color revolutions. Using all the experience of past generations, simple but effective tools like catchy sing-alongs and chanting are employed. Well known for exciting the crowd and creating a group identity, they depersonalize individuals and make them easier to manipulate. Конечно, без денег здесь не могло быть. Такое количество не государственных, различных общественных организаций, грантов, которые выделялось на Украину, это не есть секретом. Incidentally, one such organization, Hromadske TV, received generous donations from the Dutch and U.S. embassies, as well as from the Renaissance Foundation, an NGO founded by George Soros. I set up a foundation in Ukraine before Ukraine became independent of uh, Russia. Um, and the foundation has been uh, functioning ever since. And it played a, an important part in events now. I like criticism, but it must be my way. Did you see any evidence of U.S. involvement? Did you feel their uh, presence from the U.S.? Очень частыми гостями были представители Соединенных Штатов, конгрессмены, были госпожа Нуланд приезжала очень часто, у нас были с ней дискуссии. Но после этих дискуссий она шла на Майдан и поддерживала протестующих. И обвиняла правоохранительные органы, применялась чрезмерно сила. На самом деле эти все месседжи мы видели на Майдане. 
Well, members of Congress were visiting Ukraine during that period, most famously Congressman John McCain. So some of the people who were uh, challenging their government, their elected government at that point, were, were being told by the senior U.S. official, a person who ran for president and a top official in the U.S. Congress, that the U.S. was with them. I'm Senator John McCain, and it's always a pleasure to be back in Ukraine. Senator McCain was, uh, in, in a sense, giving the people in the Maiden a feeling that they had the, the backing of the most powerful country on earth. This is about the future you want for your country. This is about the future you deserve. Делегации много приезжало. Я говорил, что нельзя вмеш, нельзя говорить, во-первых, неправду. Нельзя становиться на сторону митингующих и отстаивать их права создавая тем самым и углубляя конфликт. Когда митингующие захватывают правительственные здания и учреждения, скажите, допустимо ли это в любой другой стране, например, чтобы посол Украины пришел к митингующим в Фергюсоне и раздавал там пряники или пирожки и обвинял полицейских Соединенных Штатов Америки? Я считаю, что это недопустимо ни в одной европейской стране. А почему к Украине было такое отношение? Я постоянно имел контакт с Вадином Байденом, вице-президентом. У меня были частые с ним телефонные переговоры. Но дело в том, что господин Байден говорил одно, а в Украине делали другое. Посол Соединенных Штатов в Украине постоянно принимал представителей Майдана у себя в посольстве. Мы это очень хорошо знали, мы это отслеживали. И создавалось такое впечатление, что в посольстве Соединенных Штатов существует штаб, который управляет этим процессом. In early February of 2014, as the Maiden crisis was getting more violent, there was a phone call that was intercepted. It was a call between the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Victoria Nuland, and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. Questions of credibility are being raised after a private chat between two top U.S. diplomats was leaked online. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk, it's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him? Here's the next step. Sullivan's come back to me uh, VFR saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. So you had this remarkable phone call where you have these two senior officials of the U.S. government apparently talking about a coup or how they were planning to restructure the government of Ukraine. Fuck the EU. No, exactly. I'm not saying the whole U.S. government feels that way. The there is, there is division on this, but the neoconservative element wants very much to change the strategic dynamic in Eastern Europe. The neocons are very smart people, and they've been at this for a long time. They came in around the issue of propaganda. They studied how to create hot buttons for the American people. They had this experience when they were getting the American people to get excited about Central America back in the 1980s. Sandinista regular army. The ground force is being equipped now with Russian artillery. And they've been applying those same strategies ever since. They remain very dedicated to achieving their goals. They still want to get rid of certain governments. They wanted regime change in Syria, for instance, regime change in Iran. They're very skilled at this, and they have a lot of allies now inside the news media, inside the government, and that means that they can do a lot to control the narrative of any story. So I think in America these days, we have somehow told ourselves that there are a lot of ways of dealing with these problems other than hard power. Vladimir Putin cares about hard power. The neoconservatives can now demonize a leader of a country. That sells with the American people. So you don't just sort of argue a policy. You attack the leader. So the neoconservatives became very skilled at picking out leaders, finding their ugly traits, and then highlighting them. A Yanukovych, you might say, was a rather clunky political leader, but you make him into a devil. He's, he's totally corrupt, and he's evil, and he wants to kill people in the Maidan, these wonderful white-hatted demonstrators. So you've got a black hat 
versus white hat. And, that, and they, you would keep repeating that basic scenario. And it works with the American people. We've got to realize what Vladimir Putin is. He's an old KGB colonel that wants to restore the Russian empire. You make them into demons, and the American people find that the way they can understand the world. Once that happens, it's very difficult for a journalist or anyone else to say, you know, hold it, that guy, he's got more of a gray hat than a white hat or a black hat. Uh, and if you say that, you suddenly are you're a Yanukovych apologist or you're a Putin apologist, and, and then the attacks come on to the person saying it, the journalist, the academic, or whoever. Any good director will tell you that tempo and rhythm are the most essential components to hold an audience's attention. Сама технология, которая применялась Майданом, состояла в необходимости сакральных жертв. Это часть технологии. It can also be called a method of betrayal when the allies and followers are relentlessly thrown into the revolutionary flame. The idea is simple. When the preparation work is done, the trigger just needs to be pulled to set the machine into full motion. The murder of politician Rafiq Hariri led to the Cedar Revolution. Looking back at the mysterious poisoning of Viktor Yushchenko right before the Orange Revolution of 2004, we see now that he became a sacred victim himself. Most political analysts believe the compassion of the Ukrainian people at that moment tilted the scales, giving him the presidency. The number of victims among the protesters during Euromaidan totaled over 100. They are called the Heavenly Hundred. All the sacred victims were immediately mythologized. The beating of students on November 30th, 2013, was the obvious trigger of Euromaidan. Those who sent trained provocateurs to the square very well realized that peaceful protesters were the ones who would get hurt the most. It's hard to keep protests going for months on end. Tensions subside and people inevitably get tired. Holidays are also a big danger for revolutionary masterminds. People want to be home with their families and friends, and one needs to get inventive to keep people in a cold, tent city. On Christmas Day of 2013, tabloid journalist and political wannabe Tatiana Chornovol was chosen to become the tool to whip the protests on Maidan back up. A civic activist and journalist known for investigating corruption among senior officials was beaten outside Ukraine's capital on Christmas. Her heroic deeds as a reporter looked more like petty crimes, trespassing on the presidential residence of Viktor Yanukovych, leading a rioting crowd to seize the Kiev city administration building, breaking into a car of the security service of Ukraine. It looked like Tatiana was more interested in making news than reporting it, and gaining name recognition that could be turned into votes for her struggling political career in the opposition party fatherland. She gave the world media a Christmas present in 2013, when she was cruelly beaten by unknown assailants on the road. Despite the fact that in just three days all the suspects were arrested and confessed to beating Tatiana during a road rage incident, world media kept insisting upon the political background of the crime. Instantaneously, Tatiana became a heroic martyr uniting people around her image. The beating coming amid political turmoil in Ukraine. This has drawn a protest. Euromaidan was once again center stage. And Tatiana, in less than two months after the assault, she was already healthy enough to attack the office of Party of Regions, the party of Viktor Yanukovych. One of the staff members, 65-year-old IT specialist Vladimir Zaharov, was killed during the attack. So, where is Tatiana now? Well, she finally got her position of power in the new government. One month later, the time for another act in the play came. Armenian-Ukrainian protester, 
Sergei Nigoyan, was one of the first to arrive at Maidan. He wasn't radical or violent, but instead naive and full of hope. Watching Sergei read a patriotic poem is like watching a casting tape for the role of a sacred victim. Unfortunately, Sergei got the part. Betrayed by his brothers in arms, this video would eventually go viral after Sergei was killed early in the morning of January 22nd, 2014. The circumstances of his death remain unknown to this day. Even though the whole area of protests was heavily filmed at that time, there were no records or witnesses to help the investigation, and his body was moved immediately from the scene of the crime. Sergei became the first killed martyr of Euromaidan, and in a heartbeat, the police officers were appointed as his killers. Almost two years later, the official investigation would still deliver no results. Now, it is widely believed that Nigoyan's murder was staged by provocateurs to escalate the conflict. God speaks to people with the language of signs. On January 26, 2014, Pope Francis prayed for Ukraine, addressing thousands of people at St. Peter's Square in Vatican City. After the prayer, two white doves were released from the papal window and were immediately attacked by a crow and seagull. Those who understand the language could easily read the meaning of this omen. Soon, great forces, the seagull and the crow, would be tearing apart two Slavic nations, the white doves. This omen gave hope to the Ukrainian people, saying that by God's will, the doves would be saved. But it also predicted severe hardship and many victims. The events which could enter into the history of the color revolutions as the most massive human sacrifice yet arrived right on schedule one month later. For weeks, this European capital has been the scene of a violent uprising. Today, the bloodiest day yet. The protesters are pushing up towards the government district, armed here with Molotov cocktails, but we saw handguns and shotguns too. There are casualties on both sides. Well, she's just said that there are six dead people up there. Not just injured, dead. They said they've been hit by snipers. 20 февраля начали расстреливать сотрудников милиции. Я получил информацию, что начали стрелять снайперы, и есть жертвы с двух сторон. Консерватория, откуда прозвучали первые выстрелы, это то, что было под контролем у сил Майдана. And here again we meet our old acquaintance from Narodny Ruch, Andriy Paruvi, who is at the peak of his glory as self-proclaimed commandant of Maidan, which basically means the leader of the radical opposition. The protesters were filmed leading a long line of riot police away. It's not clear where they were taking them. 67 officers are currently reported to be missing. 14 policemen dead and 43 wounded. Было погибших 20 человек и более 150 раненых огнестрельными ранениями. Тогда уже было понятно, вот 20-21 февраля, что начался вооруженный переворот. Earlier, from inside the protest camp, the opposition leader Vitaly Klitschko urged his supporters to stay put. Each of you here should stay strong in spirit, he said, because we're not going anywhere. We were в этот период времени переговоры с оппозицией и очень часто договаривались. Но, как я позже понял, что это была игра. Та часть, которая 
оппозиции, которая не принимала участие в переговорах, радикальная часть. Она не обращала внимания и никого не слушала. Они выполняли свою работу. Like in 2004, during the Orange Revolution, international leaders felt it necessary to intervene and bring both sides to the negotiating table. Приехали три министра иностранных дел европейских стран в Киев. Laurent Fabius, Frank Walter Steinmeier, Radoslav Sikorsky. Приняли участие во встрече президента Януковича и оппозиции. Договорились о том, что будут проведены досрочные выборы. Договорились о том, как будут строить отношения между оппозицией и президентом. The Ukrainian president and the leaders of the anti-government protests there have agreed on a truce. The truce was to give talks between President Yanukovych and the opposition a chance. Just like in 2004, the opposition, or at least its radical faction, the right sector, headed by Dmitry Yarosh, had no intention on fulfilling its part of the bargain. Не відповідають нашим з вами прагненням. Правий сектор не складе зброї. Правий сектор не зніме блокаду жодної з державних установ, поки не буде виконана найголовніша наша вимога – відставка Януковича. Я підписав таку протокол, але немного позже я зрозумів, що який би протокол ми не підписали, сценарій, захвата власти и государственного переворота, он был запланирован и он был неизбежен. То есть фактически это не зависело от наших действий. The opposition leaders left saying they may have found a way to end the bloodshed, but they wanted to take the conclusions from their meeting to the people. It was soon apparent that the people were not happy. И на следующий день господин Янукович уехал во второй по величине город страны, в город Харьков. Как только он уехал, захватили и его резиденцию, резиденцию администрации и правительство с помощью оружия. Как это называется? Дело в том, что я вылетел туда вертолетом. Машины, которые меня должны были сопровождать, выехали самостоятельно, но этого никто не знал. Ехали президентские машины, и по этой колонне президентских машин был открыт огонь. Также была информация у нашей разведки, что были специальные наемники, которым была поставлена задача не захватывать президента, а расстрелять. И я обратился к президенту Путину, чтобы он разрешил мне выехать на территорию России. Я получил согласие, и мне было оказано содействие. 24 февраля я попал на территорию России. At the same time, Kiev was saying its last goodbyes to the victims of the massacre. It was also welcoming those who came to power at their cost. Ukraine's parliament has voted for the new speaker of the assembly to become interim president. Alexander Turchinov called on lawmakers to form an interim government by Tuesday. These latest developments follow the dismissal of President Viktor Yanukovych on Saturday. And they removed Yanukovych not following the constitutional procedures for impeachment. Procedure impeachment was not followed. Для этого должен был быть привлечен Конституционный суд, Верховный суд. Этого не сделали. И голосовать в парламенте должны были три четвертых депутатов. The Parliament of Ukraine consists of 450 deputies. The Constitution of Ukraine requires at least a three-fourths majority to vote. In other words, 338 votes in favor of the impeachment. But only 328 deputies voted yes. Три четвертых не проголосовали. The U.S. State Department almost immediately said this was a legitimate government, and that was part of this effort to get regime change. Instead of trying to find some way to revive the February 21st agreement, where maybe you could bring back Yanukovych in some titular way, that became not a possibility anymore. Then you had eastern Ukraine resisting, you had Crimea 
wanting to break away, and things rapidly escalated. Voters will decide Sunday whether they'll leave Ukraine and join Russia. The campaign with the slogan, together with Russia, has the backing of Moscow. The Crimea situation, the referendum, is also happening during this period very quickly. Крымский референдум инициировали жители Крыма. Это была их реакция на попытки представителей Майдана устроить такой Майдан в Крыму. Это не секрет, что население Крыма всегда было пророссийски настроено. Crimean authorities, sensing the mood of the populace, fully supported Viktor Yanukovych's decision to postpone the 2013 European Union Association deal and side deeper ties to Russia. As the events in Kiev took their course, Crimean authorities issued a declaration putting into words the fears of its people. Based on the will of the Crimeans who elected us, we declare that we will not give Crimea to extremists and neo-Nazis seeking to seize power in Ukraine at the cost of the blood of the country and its citizens. After the regime change in Kiev, rumors began spreading in Crimea that the new authorities would be merciless to those that opposed them. This led to the pro-Russian demonstrations rejecting the new government in Kiev. On February 27th, the government buildings in the capital of Crimea were seized by pro-Russian protesters. The current Crimean government was dismissed, and the new leader, Sergei Aksionov, was assigned as the leader of the Crimean Autonomous Republic. У них, конечно, надежда была, и они обращались к российскому руководству, чтобы их защитили. On March 16th, the Crimean referendum was held and the people voted to leave Ukraine and enter the Russian Federation. The situation in Crimea is being presented as a, a Russian invasion. And again, nobody who looks at this seriously and looks at the poll numbers, some of the poll numbers done by the U.S. government agencies themselves, showing that the people of Crimea preferred being part of Russia. In the U.S. news media, it has all been presented as the Russians invaded, they then staged a sham election, with people with guns at their backs. Somehow they faked the ballot boxes to get 96% approval for uh, rejoining Russia. The idea of a referendum in Crimea is uh, just quite simply unconstitutional. It does raise questions on whether this vote really is free and fair, especially given the heavy military presence in Crimea right now, Errol. So that's how it's been sold to the American people. The reality is very different. The atmosphere here certainly is electric. Thousands of people who've gathered in the capital Crimean city of Simferopol, all of this following a referendum held last Sunday in which the majority of people here overwhelmingly voted in support of being reunited with Russia. I would like to ask, what is такое democracy? Democracy is a politics based on the will of выясняется воля народа. В современном мире с помощью голосования. Люди пришли свыше 90%. И свыше 90% проголосовали за присоединение к России. Нужно уважать выбор людей. Не подстраивать каждый раз под свои геополитические интересы международное право и принципы демократии. У нас не было там никаких боевых действий. Там никто не стрелял, никто никого не убивал. What is described in the West as a Russian invasion of Crimea is, in fact, the presence of Russian soldiers in Crimea. Can you clarify that? Российские солдаты в Крыму, как говорят, были испокон веков, потому что база Черноморского флота была в Крыму. As long ago as 1804, Sevastopol's naval base became the main military port of the Russian Empire on the Black Sea. During the Second World War, the heroic defense of Sevastopol lasted almost a year and took hundreds of thousands of lives. Therefore, the naval base in Crimea has a legacy of historical pride for the Russian Black Sea Fleet as well as being of huge strategic importance.
those of us alive back then remember when there were Soviet uh, missiles put into Cuba, how frightened Americans were and how angry, and how we almost went to uh, a nuclear confrontation over having weapons of that kind of destruction placed that close to the United States. If the United States considers Cuba to be in its backyard, then Crimea lays at Russia's doorstep. The consequences of a U.S. seizure of the base or a NATO base. Very difficult. Because the base by itself doesn't mean anything. But what I wanted to point out is one nuance. Why do we so quickly react to the expansion of NATO? It worries us about the practice of taking decisions. I know how they are taken. When страна становится членом НАТО, ей уже очень трудно сопротивляться давлению со стороны такой крупной страны, лидера НАТО, как США. И там легко появляется, может появиться все что угодно. Система противоракетной обороны, и новые базы, и если потребуется, и новые ударные комплексы. А нам что делать? Мы должны в этой связи предпринимать контрмеры, то есть ставить под удар наших ракетных систем те объекты, которые, по нашему мнению, начинают нам угрожать. If we are attacked, uh, we would certainly respond. Знаете, мне кажется, я не всегда понимаю логику наших партнеров. Иногда сталось впечатление, что нужно держать в повиновении и наладить дисциплину в своем собственном западном так называемом атлантическом лагере. Для этого нужен внешний враг. При всех опасениях Иран на это не очень тянет. I am concerned about the expansion of NATO. NATO has expanded into 13 countries up to the borders of Russia. 13 countries. Это тема очень опасная. Это тема войны. Вообще война между Россией и Соединенными Штатами вообще это безумие. In early spring of 2014, eastern Ukraine was also buzzing with protests against the new authorities in Kiev. This region, with the population close to Russia geographically and culturally, feared that the ultra-right leanings of the newly formed government would bring neo-nationalism to their lands. And they had their reasons. The status of the Russian language in Ukraine has been a stumbling block for many years. Implementing Russian as a second state language was one of the main campaign promises of President Viktor Yanukovych. In 2012, the Yanukovych government passed a law making it the second official language in the southern and eastern parts of Ukraine, the areas where the Russian-speaking population makes up a majority. Ukrainian nationalist groups initiated massive protests opposing the law. An observing viewer might see some familiar faces there. On February 23, 2014, the very next day after the regime change, the new government voted for an annulment of the official status of the Russian language. And even though later this decision was vetoed by the acting president, Alexander Turchinov, it still sent a message, and a powerful one. This alarmed the Russian-speaking cities of eastern Ukraine, and people took to the streets to show their disagreement. In response, pro-Maidan groups conducted their own demonstrations. When the two parties would meet, it was always tense, and eventually it led to tragedy. One person died and over 50 people were wounded in clashes during a pro-Russian march, protesting the new government in Kiev. On April 6th, the Crimean scenario began repeating in eastern Ukraine where protesters seized government buildings. And the next day, April 7th, they proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic. Kiev replied by announcing the beginning of an anti-terrorist operation in eastern Ukraine. By that time, the international media was screaming about a Russian invasion in Ukraine. Russia could now be on the verge of invading Ukraine. But strong words stayed only in the media. The Ukrainian authorities never announced a warlike situation. Why? 
IMF cannot give money to countries engaged in ongoing war. Petro Poroshenko. Too much money was already invested in Ukraine to stop halfway. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. На развитие какой демократии тратились эти деньги? Как называли установление демократического режима? Я думаю, что это вот как раз тот режим, который сейчас насаждается на Донбассе. Obviously, the funds had to keep coming, and the conflict had to keep going. Getting more and more bloody and deadly. Мы завалили все вместе. As parties from both sides were using more sophisticated and lethal weapons. Господин Турчина, который фактически начал войну, он несет огромную ответственность за это. Он начал войну против собственного народа. Он послал войска в Донбасс. Они сделали то, чего не делал я. И они начали кровопролитие. The world seemed too busy welcoming this new democracy in Kiev to notice what was being done as it spread its wings over the country. Many in southern Ukraine had been viewing the revolution with concern. And an anti-Maidan movement formed in the city of Odessa in early January 2014. The protesters set up their camp in front of the Trade Union House, a building which would soon become a monument to a massacre of its own. It's difficult to overestimate the importance of Odessa. It is strategically located on the Black Sea, and it's Ukraine's largest seaport. It's not surprising that Ukraine's new authorities were watching the situation unfolding there with growing alarm. More and more of Odessa's people were joining the anti-Maidan movement at the same time as events in eastern Ukraine were heating up. The new Ukrainian government didn't have the power to wage war on too many fronts. If Odessa were to join the growing uprising in the eastern regions, it would seriously complicate the situation. This rebellion had to be extinguished immediately and at any cost, and that cost was high. On May 2, 2014, Soccer fans flocked to the center of Odessa city for the Ukrainian championship match. Surprisingly, a great number of these fans who descended into Odessa just the night before also turned out to be fighters from the Maidan self-defense units, along with members of radical organizations from all parts of Ukraine. <laughs> These fans, masked, armed, and shouting nationalist mottos, began disturbances in the center of the city as they marched to the anti-Maidan tent encampment, where they attacked. The anti-Maidan protesters sought shelter in the trade union house, but it was a trap. Maidan supporters started throwing Molotov cocktails into the building until it was engulfed in flames. People burned to death inside, or trying to escape, jumped from the windows. Although a fire station was less than a mile away, it took almost half an hour for firefighters to arrive. When they finally did, the damage had been done. But here's an intriguing fact. Just a few days before those dreadful events, a messenger from Maidan, Andriy Perubi, made a visit to Odessa. It's an interesting coincidence that some of the people he met with in Odessa were seen at the scene that fateful day. But not everyone was mourning. On the popular political talk show, Schuster Live, the news about the people burnt alive in Odessa was welcomed with a long round of applause. Из погибших пожарів в Одесі 15 граждан Росії, 10 із Придністров'я і ні одного одесіта. On its Facebook page, the right sector announced the events of May 2nd, a proud moment in national history. An official investigation into this sad event has been going on now for nearly two years, and it's yet to reach a conclusion. But it seems the experts had all the information they needed from the very beginning. Звичайно, провокація була сторони 
путинських бойовиків, які почали розкіл української демонстрації. It looks like Odessa really is a very important piece of real estate, as it was honored with a very special new governor appointed on May 30th of 2015. Mikhail Saakashvili, an old friend of the United States and born and raised in Ukraine's neighboring country, Georgia. A little hoe down there in Georgia. A quick look at his biography gives one an understanding that he's been groomed for a special mission. <laughs> Mr. Saakashvili received a U.S. State Department scholarship, and he worked for a New York law firm which represented the organization Kamara, a group that appeared earlier when we learned about the color revolutions. We are dealing with democratic, bloodless revolution. This is the Revolution of Roses, and this is Mikhail Saakashvili with Kamara, busy overthrowing the legitimately elected president, Eduard Shevardnadze. Remove the government by peaceful means. That's classics. You know, you're really European. I'm sure. Soon after the Rose Revolution blossomed fully, Georgia announced its intentions to join NATO and plant fresh NATO military bases in the fertile soil right on Russia's border. Never ever we will give our freedom and independence. Never ever we will give any piece of our territory. Saakashvili's mission was accomplished, at least with his friends in NATO. The Georgian populace wasn't quite as happy, though. In 2007, they took to the streets to voice discontent. And Mr. Saakashvili responded with force. The people's discontent grew. Saakashvili's party lost parliamentary elections and the opposition took control. He said, this means that the parliamentary majority should set up a new government and me as the president according to our constitution. Mikhail decided not to wait for the results of the president's election and fled the country in October 2013. In 2014, Saakashvili refused summons to appear in court as a witness in several criminal cases. Later that same year, he was accused of misuse of power and embezzlement. Saakashvili wound up in the U.S., and soon his friends in Washington found him a new assignment. Mikhail actively supported Maidan, and very soon was rewarded with a high position in the new Ukrainian government. First as the president's counselor, and then as the governor of Odessa. The day before taking this position, he renounced his citizenship to Georgia, the country of his birth, and became a Ukrainian citizen. As they say, the battle is worth the blood, both literally and figuratively. Я прекрасно знаю реальную цену реформ господина Саакашвили. Я прекрасно знаю то, что он на Украине на самом деле является частью проекта, который нужно осуществить Украине определенным силам. Jeffrey Payet, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, paid a visit to Saakashvili just a month after he took office in Odessa. But as long as the Oblast administration is delivering results on Ukraine, you are going to see a steady flow of embassy and Washington visitors coming here. The meeting was fruitful, and Jeffrey generous. No matter how well Saakashvili's job goes, it looks like he shouldn't be worried about his own finances. On his Facebook page, he posted an official document showing that the new governor of Odessa gets a pretty penny from Washington, almost $200,000 a year. For comparison, the governor of Maine gets $70,000 a year. So if Odessa became a new U.S. state, it would be at the top of the list. Mr. Saakashvili should feel right at home in his newly adopted country. He is best of friends with fellow color revolutionary leader Viktor Yushchenko, who's the godfather of his son. Governor of Odessa Oblast, is the former president Saakashvili. It's just a plea for oppression, Odessa, and the whole Ukrainian people. He didn't even give him a work visa in the United States. The universities in which they tried to work hard didn't want him to take him on a permanent job. Значит, а, а исполнять обязанности значит, губернатора Одессы он может.
а что нет, нет порядочных, профессиональных и способных выполнять такую работу украинцев. A war, once launched, doesn't choose its victims. We are just learning at this hour that Malaysian Airlines has now confirmed that it has lost contact with one of its planes. The plane was indeed shot down by a missile while flying at a high altitude over eastern Ukraine near the Russian border. 298 revised number of souls on board, all feared dead. It was a murder. It was a crime. There's been this odd nonchalance about pursuing the answers. There was a report, a very limited report, put out a few months after the event. But since then, they said the next report will be on the first anniversary of the event. But you deal with a criminal investigation before it becomes a cold case. So there's been this curious element of why is there not greater pressure from both the media and the, uh, the Western governments to answer these questions. But even without any answers, the fingers were pointed immediately. That's not an accident. That is happening because of Russian support. Evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by a surface-to-air missile that was launched from an area that is controlled by Russian-backed separatists inside of Ukraine. The Malaysian Boeing wasn't the first plane to play a significant part in American-Russian relationships. On September 1, 1983, Korean Airlines Flight 007 from New York to Seoul via Anchorage was shot down by a Soviet interceptor aircraft over the territory of the USSR in the Sea of Japan. There was absolutely no justification, either legal or moral, for what the Soviets did. The tragedy of the Korean Boeing was considered a perfect occasion to demonstrate the NATO military power within dangerous proximity to the Soviets. On November 2nd, 1983, NATO launched Able Archer, a 10-day command post exercise simulating a conflict escalation, culminating in a nuclear attack. It was followed by placing Pershing II nuclear missiles in Europe. What Reagan didn't take into consideration was the paranoid overreaction of the Soviets. A recently declassified U.S. intelligence report shows that for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world was that close to nuclear war. Just like in 1983, the Malaysian Boeing crash was leveraged against the enemy. A new wave of sanctions hit Russia immediately after the tragedy. The United States is imposing new sanctions in key sectors of the Russian economy. Almost a year and three months later, the Dutch Safety Board published a report. Ladies and gentlemen, flight MH17 crashed because of a 9N314M warhead detonated outside the aeroplane above the left side of the cockpit. The report didn't blame any specific group or person and estimated a very wide area of 320 kilometers as a zone from which the missile was fired. At the same time, the Russian producer of Buk missiles, Almazante, conducted its own independent investigation. Результаты эксперимента полностью опровергли выводы голландской комиссии о типе ракеты и месте запуска. During the experiment, they blew up a retired airliner with a Buk missile and came to the conclusion that the Malaysian plane was brought down by the older type of missiles, not used by Russia anymore, but still in the possession of Ukraine. The company claims that the missile was launched from the territory controlled by the Ukrainian military. One would expect that these controversial results would again stir up public interest in the investigation, but the tragedy of Malaysian flight MH17 had already played its role in the big geopolitical game. Therefore, it was soon forgotten. The goal was achieved. After the third wave of sanctions hit Russia, the tensions between the two countries skyrocketed. So the question presents itself. Are we truly witnessing the beginning of Cold War 2.0? And if so, what are our chances to survive at this time?
In 1947, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists introduced the Doomsday Clock. It represents a countdown to global nuclear annihilation. In 1953, during the height of the Cold War, it came its closest to midnight as the superpowers were creating massive nuclear arsenals. This is the story of America's ever-expanding atomic weapons program. As the world began to grasp the insane danger of nuclear warfare and took measures to control the arms race, the situation steadily improved. In 1991, the doomsday clock was at its furthest from midnight, 17 minutes. That time of hope was short-lived, though, as the world has become more and more unstable. But in 2015, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the clock to just three minutes to midnight. Today, unchecked climate change and a nuclear arms race resulting from modernization of huge arsenals pose extraordinary and undeniable threats to the continued existence of humanity. The United States and Russia have embarked on massive programs to modernize their nuclear arsenals, undermining existing nuclear weapons treaties. The clock ticks now at just three minutes to midnight because international leaders are failing to perform their most important duty ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization. La lámpara de 20 watts consume 3 kWh al mes como promedio. Apaga la luz al salir de la habitación. Ahorra hora 
por tu economía. Felicitaciones por pensar en la sobrecarga de las mujeres y no permitirla, por ser ejemplo de corresponsabilidad en el cuidado, compartes las funciones de la familia, cuidas sin violencia y con equidad. Tú puedes en la nueva normalidad.